brother. Oh, What's up? This is a hey, big party, it, man. Yeah, I brother, can like, dig like, it. Stop right on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> oh man, my my my. Uh, good morning and welcome to the Earl Ingram Show. As always, you can join us at eight four four nine six seven twenty seven eighty nine. You can text us at that same number. Hey Sandy, uh, is my head on my shoulders? Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, oh, okay. Well, I, you, yeah. I, I, I'm just having trouble this morning, kind Getting- of. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> putting one one before two. Hey, what's up? So, uh, hey, good morning, Calvin. How you doing, man? I'm doing good, Earl. You know, it's very sticky outside, but I think it's going to break tonight, hopefully. Yeah, it it is, man. It's it's sultry uh, outside. Cat, and... cat on a hot tin roof. Yeah. <laughs> hey, hey it's, it's Tuesday. So that means it's Tuesdays with my co-host Sandy Williams and Sandy. Good morning to you. You were just where was it at? Where you were at in the sauna? You were out of you were out of the country. No, I was in Utah. You're in Utah. Yeah, and it was hotter than this, but it wasn't as humid. It was hotter than this. It was a hundred, hundred and hundred and two hundred. Yeah, hmm? yeah. And and slow walk hot, I call it. Yeah. <laughs> and and you can tell a difference in the humidity. Yeah, it was. Uh, yeah, this is this is much more like Houston than it is like uh, like uh, Phoenix. Really? So yeah. so so Houston, they get a lot of. Oh, Houston, Houston is humid, hot, humid, deadly hot kind of thing. Well, yeah, it's, man. Uh, you'd have to all you have to do is spend a couple of couple of days in Houston in the summer, and you know that you're living in a better place. And oh, you mean where we are? Yeah. Oh. yeah. Yeah, I guess I guess it's safe to say that. Um, so you know, I, I'm I'm just uh, what am I, Sandy? Uh, you know, I'm oh, a, I'm you, a fingers you, attached. You, you want me to fi- uh, you want me to fill in the blank? <laughs> no, or you know, you don't fingers, want me to do that. I'm a fingers attached to my hands. I think so. I don't know. Uh, yeah. You know, it's it's one of those mornings, but I uh, I guess we'll get through it uh, with your support and your help. So Sandy, um, it's the blind leading the blind. <laughs> hey, um, Sandy, I was looking at this article in the wall street journal of all places and, uh, oh no, not that one in the associated press. And it says, Hey Calvin, you ever played pickleball? We played it in gym class when I was in high school, but that's the last time <laughs> See, it's been around. A while. It's, yeah. You played pickleball in high school. Yep, it was the first time I had ever heard of it. It wasn't really on, like, they weren't doing news stories on it back when I played it in high school. Wow, that's a long time ago, man. Yeah, it's going on eight years now. Yeah, that is a long time. So pickleball's been around. It's been around for a while. And I I have to confess, I bought pickleball paddles and (laughs) pickleballs and thought that maybe I'd play pickleball, but it really never materialized uh, other than a couple of bonks where you, you know you hit it and it makes a bonk noise and to the point where there are neighborhoods and places where there are pickleball courts where the neighbors get incensed by the noise of the pickleball and they they can't play it after nine o'clock so it's huh how about that well so what does the paddle look like it looks like a like a big heavy ping pong paddle oh okay yeah yeah looks, it, looks it, just like a ping pong paddle except a little bigger yeah there's a game called platform tennis it looks a great deal like the platform tennis paddle well, and, so and, and it's clearly designed for uh, people who are moving towards geriatric, away from youth. But it's really taken hold, and and there are actually professional pickleball players, and you can turn on, you can find it on YouTube, you can find it on TV. That John McEnroe played a, in a pickleball. He had a he had another pro. I can't remember who his partner was, and uh, they they play pickleball. Oh, so so Brendan says lazy American tennis. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, yeah. So, 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 does American tennis have a pickleball problem? Upstart boom looms out of view at the U.S. Open. So, Sandy, I've never played pickleball. One of the reasons why I never played pickleball is I fancy myself, well, not exactly an athlete anymore, but. It um, seems like it's not very athletic. Right? 
Yeah. And, yeah. you know, I played racquetball. I still play a little bit from time to time. Never played handball. But uh, racquetball, yes. Tennis, yes. Mm -hmm. And part of me says, man, has it, has, have I fallen that far? I think you have. <laughs> uh, I think it's Come time. Come on, I man. Think, I think it's time. Come no, on, man. Pickleball, actually, it requires, <laughs> actually, the, when, when it's played well, it's, I was saying uh, before the show, you know, badminton. People think badminton is something you, that, that's sort of the same kind of sport, right, for old, yeah. old folks and whatever. Badminton played well, and they, I think it's even an Olympic sport, is, is an immensely difficult sport. Uh, the Pakistanis and some of the countries where badminton is big will have 100-shot volleys and lots of running. You know, uh, the cardiovascular uh, uh, content of good badminton is very high. You have to be a really good athlete. So... You know, maybe pickleball, but pickleball doesn't have that potential. Well, the thing about badminton is that thing flies up in the air, and it takes a while sometimes for it to come down. It gives you a little little time to get around, right? Yeah, uh -huh. You know, so, you know, it does float a little bit. I don't think the pickleball. Pickleball's got a lot of definite rules, too. There's a dead zone near the net. You can't be in there when you stand in there when you're hitting a ball, uh, on the fly at least. Uh, and, uh, yeah, it's, it's like, but it's a bit like, it's like ping pong standing on the table. Uh, in a way. <laughs> so, 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 uh, Sandy, only you could explain it. <laughs> ping pong standing on the table. Yeah. Uh, but that's about right. Yeah. I know. <laughs> Let's go to Charles from Milwaukee. Good morning, teacher. I bet Charles plays pickleball. Oh, wait, wait, guys. You pickleball is great. So the first time I saw it was at the 2018 American Transplant Games in Salt Lake City, Utah. And I'm like, huh, this looks pretty exciting. So then at the last Transplant Games in 20, the ones I just went to in 24 in Birmingham, Alabama, I had my friend Stacy play with my friend Josh. And Stacy had never played it before and did a tutorial the night before and actually her and Josh won a silver medal at the transplant games in Birmingham, Alabama. So God willing, my plan is to play pickleball, um, at the 26 games, um, wherever they are held in America. It is so much fun. It is, it's like an oversized, um, ping pong. So if you can play ping pong, pickleball would be right up your alley. Hey, man, that's great news, man. Congratulations. Although the fact that someone gets a silver medal when they haven't played it before suggests <laughs> the competition might not have been what it could be. There. Sandy, why would you burst the bubble? Oh, I know. I'm sorry. Uh, but I, no, it is. No, and, and no, actually, it's become a serious game. And yeah. People play it continually and are addicted to it. And, uh, and, and I think that the game is reaching younger and younger. I think it started out being sort of the middle-aged and up, and I think actually now it's become a, a game. So, Charles, how often do you get out and play uh, wiffle, I mean, uh, excuse me, pickleball? <laughs> so, we, <laughs> we get out and play at least twice a week. There's a court. Um, they actually have a league, so we don't we don't pay for the league. We go after they're done, but it's, I want to say is I think it's eight or ten courts, and they're, they're full, and you see so many young oh, yeah. people coming to play now. It is it is so much fun, but no, Sandy, the team that they actually lost to uh -huh. were really good. There was a team from California and Nevada. They were together. Yeah. And this, this couple, this team was really good. And they just, Josh had played before. So he knew the ins and outs. So he would, he could cover a lot of the court, but, um, it is a lot of fun. It's, uh, it's very competitive. Some people get very, very feisty about it. Um, a lot of older people get very upset and very competitive about it. So you could do some damage. I think you should try it out. You could do you some can. physical damage with those paddles. Hey, 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 Charles, man, thank you very much, man. Uh, really appreciate it. Thanks for letting us know. You know, Sandy, Brendan says, well, we have clay or grass pickleball. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Tom, 51 million jobs created since 1989. Dems 50 million. Oh, okay. Yeah. I thought he was talking about pickleball. Yeah. That, that. Uh, but anyway, Sandy, I will say to you, uh, 
I can just see myself, you know, sitting back in the easy chair waiting for the pickleball championship. Uh, to watch it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah like I it, told you, John, Mac, I, I can't remember who his partner was, but McEnroe was playing it. No, it's it's taken the world and taken the country by storm. I think it's because it's a game that, that everyone can participate in, and that's one of the problems with tennis. When tennis, you've got to play with someone who's just yeah, pretty athletic. Is, and is yeah. your equal. Whatever, oh, whatever yeah. level you're at, your opponent needs to be the same. If they're much better, it's no fun. If they're worse, it's no fun. So that makes it a, a bit of a difficult game right there. So, well, and, and pickleball has got a much shorter learning curve. And it's, I think, also one of those games, though, where you, you can't ever get as good as you might get, so you can keep working on it. Well, and husband and wife teams can. Yeah. I, I see husbands and wives. Yeah, mixed, you know. mixed doubles and tennis was always a, a precursor to divorce. <laughs> but I don't think that's sort of the case. In, Come uh, on, man. Yeah. You know, it really, it really, uh, yeah. Pickleball. Sandy, uh, you're convincing me to try pickleball. I think you need to. I want to get a video. Sandy, if I, listen, I'm going I'm to post it. Too. Listen, Sandy, if yeah. I, the guys that I played tennis with who are still playing tennis, uh-huh. I see them 70s, mid 70s, some almost 80 years old, they're still playing tennis. And and you think Earl is going to be the first of the guys to go and trade in the rackets for pickleball? Yeah, I I I, I can't counsel you, Earl, but I, <laughs> I think it might be time. <laughs> well, well, when was the last time you played tennis? See, it's been a long. It's time. been a while since yeah, I played. See, tennis. There you go. Right, you've graduated. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, yeah. The evil consequences of time yep. take you away from the tennis court and push you right on to the pickleball court. Out, out, right, can't breathe. Yeah, anyway. Do, do, any, do any of us escape that? No. Oh. Okay. Well, you can escape it, but it, the escape is not a good one. <laughs> hey, only, only in the vernacular of Sandy Williams. Yeah. Uh, 844 844-967-2789. You know, when we come back, we're going to get into some serious stuff. It's Tuesday. That means Tuesdays with my co-host, Sandy Williams, and you. We're going to talk about teachers burning out on the job. Out, out, brief camp. <laughs> <laughs> Get rich quick if you need dig dig with a shovel or a pick. In a mine, in a mine, in a mine, in a mine, where a million diamonds shine. We dig 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 from All right, welcome back to the Earl Ingram Show. As always, you can join us at 844-967-2789. Text us. At that same number, it's Tuesday. That means Tuesdays with my co-host Sandy Williams. And Sandy, uh, I don't you know want what to try to explain there. what that is. Well, I thought it was going to be hi ho, hi ho, and off to work <laughs> we go. But maybe that was the lead-in, and we had we didn't get to hi ho. But yeah, the music today is about work, settling down to work, because that's what's that's what the next seventy-four days are going to be all about. So, Sandy, let's let's this article in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, this morning, and it talks about, you know, school is getting ready to kick off again, and all over the nation, these schools are having trouble with teachers. The amazing thing about it, Sandy, is during the baby boom era, when we had so many children there was no problem with, with having enough teachers. There are a lot less children now than there were during the baby booms and a lot less teachers. What do you attribute that to? Well, I think it's what we've done, what society has done to teaching, uh, to teachers. Uh, number one, they've politicized it. 
many teachers are living in school districts where school districts are have been politicized and uh, and are taking on teachers and and accusing them of indoctrinating their children of uh, you know essentially uh, viewing them as as part of a, a massive kind of conspirational eff- effort to affect children negatively uh, and that's hurt teachers you know that the teachers are continue to be these people who give up some income the potential income for the purpose of doing a job that's that they really want to do and love to do and needs to be done. Back in our day, teachers lived in the community with us in the, in the school districts, typically where they taught and they were highly regarded people. They were, they were, uh, revered by the community. They were, they were given a high station in life without the income, but they had high station and, 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 and got a lot of, uh, of, uh, of high regard from, from the local people, uh, and were respected. I think that's turned around now. Plus the fact teachers are asked to do all kinds of paperwork. The job of teaching itself has become much more administrative than it used to be. And so I think it just has led to burnout. Plus the fact many people are teaching in school districts that have changed. Okay. Where, where, where a discipline has become a big problem within the classroom based on what's happened to schools, the number of kids who now go to private schools and not public schools, but the, the general, uh, reputation for the teaching profession has declined materially in society. And I think that's the problem. I've got a son who's a teacher and he's faced these issues. And I think it's very, uh, it causes burnout at a very young age. Uh, People aren't getting out of it what they used to get, the validation that they used to get the personal satisfaction. And without that, the low income doesn't make any sense. So is it safe to say in American society, the teachers have been, uh, uh, you know, devalued uh, because ch- uh, people, children are being educated all over the, the, the earth. And then many of these other countries are doing better than the students are and the children are in, in, in our nation. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, we've a whole bunch of things have come to play here. I mean, uh, teachers are the subject of lawsuits. Discipline in the classroom has become a very dicey matter. How, how can you discipline students in the classroom? How do you maintain order? Everyone uh, talks about how order needs to be maintained, but then the law has become such that it's very difficult to toe the line as to exactly what you can do in the classroom in order to maintain order. Uh, and teachers are getting second-guessed here. Much of the other other places in the in the world are handling instruction in a different manner and are continuing, I think, to hold teachers in high regard. You know, teachers in this nation uh, are blamed when the students aren't learning. It's your fault that Earl is not learning, Sandy. You're the reason that Earl is not learning. Never mind all of the other things that Earl has to deal with that in that affect him not being prepared to learn when he comes to school. I've, I've seen this firsthand. I spent 12 years, you know, volunteering in the district and watching children come not prepared, not in any condition by the time they get to school, Sandy, to learn. Yeah. And yet teachers are held accountable uh, for the children not learning. And, and you constantly hear, Teachers are complaining about how much money they make. They're freeloaders. They get two months off a year. I mean, you, you've you heard this, right? Oh, and that's always been the refrain. My question is, that, <laughs> what, what are you going to do for how many jobs are out there that you can get for two months? You know, you can't make it up because you've got two months off. Uh, it, it's almost a curse in a way. This, this, the, and, and as you were describing, uh, teachers don't get paychecks during that period. So if they aren't terribly careful with their paychecks, they, they end up being uh, between a rock and a hard spot during their, their two months off in the summer. Um, no, I think, I think we, we need to re-elevate teaching in our society. And, and we need to both recognize it with in, uh, adequate income, and we have to reevaluate how it is that society is, is t- uh dealing with its teachers and how are, how, you know, how are we handling the, the interaction between society and teachers? Because that has deteriorated. I will say this, um, in my time in the, in the school system, so many special needs children and special needs teachers 
who who have to deal with special needs children of all different kinds of special needs in one classroom. And there are te- children in classrooms with physical maladies, as well as there are children in classrooms with, with you know, um, cognitive maladies. Yeah. And yet you, you got one teacher in there with 20 kids. What do you think the stress level is, Sandy, for that person? Well, you know, and I, this, there's, there's a problem in our education system, and the solution to it is not going to be vouchers. Vouchers, in many respects, have been the problem because uh, the, much like uh, an insurance pool, you, an insurance pool needs to have a whole lot of healthy people in it in order for health insurance to be affordable. Schools need to have a whole lot of people in the school system who are uh, actively interested in learning, who are capable of learning, who are coming from households where learning is held in high regard so that the example can be set within the school system. And, you know, that's been lost by the, by the fact of the va- people vacating the public school system with the assistance of vouchers and moving on. He found it. He did find uh, it. 8549672789 is the number. It's Tuesday. That means Tuesdays with my co-host Sandy Williams and you on the Earl Ingram Show. Hang on the guys. Hang on. I know that guy's voice. Wilbur Harrison. Okay. He's a, he's a blues singer from the 40s and 50s. Yeah, and probably from New Orleans. Yeah. You can kind of tell. Uh, 844-967-2789. Uh, you can text us at that same number. It's Tuesday. That means Tuesdays with my co-host, Sandy Williams. And so we're talking about education for a couple more moments and, and the trials and tribulations of you know, educators and the fact that there's a lack of them in this country and it's getting smaller and smaller. And, you know, the opportunities, you know, Sandy, with the different districts that have opened up, uh, just pinching more and more. Well, you know, you know, look at this, uh, the, the project 2025 and the Republican plat- platform basically is all about uh, getting rid of the Department of Education at the federal level. And there's this kind of a politicized assault on education and curriculums in education at the local level. And there's this pay structure problem uh, for for people who are working in education who are no longer getting the kind of uh, personal validation and personal uh, uh, comfort from the job that they were that they intended to uh, pursue when they decided to go into teaching. They took a an income. They sacrificed some income for the purpose of doing something they thought was was uh, very important. I thought it was. I thought it was significant that Kamala Harris, in her uh, acceptance speech, mentioned the notion of getting adequate pay for teachers and and write and writing our education process. Uh, and so I think it is kind of on the ballot as well this issue at the national level. But surely we have to do something societally to make sure that teachers get the respect uh, that they that they should be getting. Uh, and what's interesting is the people who are politicizing it probably all were educated in the public school system themselves, or predominantly so. Uh, they most of them uh, were pre-voucher, pre, uh, you know, pre-federal support, and pre-state support for private education, and pre-homeschooling. The trend towards homeschooling is 
quite recent. So all of those people found public education, I'm quite sure, to be very adequate for their own personal needs. And now, for some reason, it's under assault. All right, let's go to Brendan from New Jersey. Good morning to you, Brendan. Thank you very much for the call. You say what? Uh, I just wanted to kind of go conspiracy a little bit and factual on the other side. And the conspiracy, I guess you could call it that, uh, is that Republicans have been trying to pull money out of public education for a long time. True. Uh, as Sandy mentioned, Project 2025 does just that by destroying the uh, the DOE. But the other problem I see, and, and my wife has a friend who's a retired teacher. My daughter has friends who are in teaching. First thing that's happening that I see, teach good teachers, uh, because of the problems with kids and cell phones and the yes. lack of attention they're able to pay, are rushing from teaching positions wanting to get into administrative positions within the school. So they go back to school very quickly and they get degrees and they move on to the administrative. So we're losing good teachers. On top of that, with the pay issue, how many people thought about going into school and or college and getting a teaching degree? And I've just said, you know what? I need to be able to take care of my family and I need to be able to get a solid pay for a solid day's work. And lastly, I would say, give the classroom back to the teachers. Get yes. the parents out of the classroom. <laughs> yes. Okay? Your, your son or daughter is not a genius. Uh, and to the PE teacher, they're not, they're not the next greatest sports thing coming along. Let the teachers run the classrooms. When kids come in, let them sit at a desk. Instead of sitting wherever they want, because this is one of the things that happen, kids just come in and can sit wherever they want and kind of do whatever they want. Uh, we need to get school back to what school was. Hey, Brendan, I can't disagree with anything you had to say. You were right on point with all of it. Uh, let's go to Cassandra from Middleton. Good morning to you, Cassandra. You say what? Hi. Um, thanks for taking my call. You know what? I would like to elaborate on what Brendan said said because he stole my thunder and he and the point that he made regarding administrators in the school system is point on and what I would like for perhaps our elected leaders to consider is requiring administrators to become licensed they have to have formal credentials other than a uh, master's or a doctorate. Uh, merely having a degree does not mean you are qualified to be a administrator in that particular field. And uh, many of them, they are not um, well versed on educational policies, the educational laws, and many of them sadly have never taught in a classroom. Many of these administrators, they, um, they take classes in college, they transition to graduate school, and then they are hired as administrators right. at, uh, um, at the elementary, high school, and college level. So there has to be some other form of qualification um, requiring, number one, classroom experience, Number two, actual leadership training. And, um, and I, I couldn't agree with, with Brendan Moore. It, um, I, am, I am an instructor, and I've been teaching for 16 years now, and it is probably one of the most difficult times for me as an instructor, particularly after COVID, because many of the students, um, they are dealing with, number one, um, some emotional issues or trauma, I should say, from the lockdown. Number two, many of them did not get the skills that they needed to prepare them for, um, for, the, for the next level of their education. Yeah, but Cassandra, you're, you're, you're a college professor. And, and you're saying that even students who are now in college have suffered be, because of COVID, and you can see that even on the college level. Yes. Yes, absolutely. We're seeing it. Um, the lack of, of communication skills. 
that is one of the big issues that I that I am having. Students, um, because of COVID, they did not have that social interaction. So they do not know how to express themselves and problem solve. And many of them, they did not get, get those skills, which is, I mean, which is a life um, skill that you need to have. So yes, um, we do have to recognize how COVID and the lockdown has impaired, not all, but some of our children. Um, so that, that's really all I have. And I would, uh, I am listening to what other people have to say and what their impressions hey, are. Hey, Cassandra, thank, thank you. Thank you very much for the call. Sandy, you know, she, she she pointed out and she's again on the college level so well you know you know one of the things that the, the pandemic did was require essentially that everyone get in a way homeschooled and so i think this reflects what might be a societal problem if homeschooling becomes a predominant way of schooling you know and, and many places and part of project 2025 is sort of premised on the notion that homeschooling or or private schooling is the better option to, to public schooling and um i think that the, the socialization thing is a very important phenomena, part of schooling, and socialization in a broad in the broad context of society, which is the very experience you get in public school. Okay, you get a you get to go to school right. with a bunch of people who might not be just like you, uh, and that's the way you're going to live your life when you get out of school as well. So, I think Cassandra's hit on something, which is school needs to prepare you in a bunch of ways, and part of it has to do with communication skills, and we're going to have to fight uphill on that one anyway because the cell phone and oh. the internet and all of that is kind of destroying the normal forms of, of interpersonal communication, both writing and, 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 and true writing skills. Cause everyone now writes in three words or less, all the concepts and you know, everything, right. everything's a, a posting uh, on something like X uh, tweeting. Uh, and then, and then just interpersonal skills uh, in terms of actually dealing with human beings instead of the virtual a uh, human being you're talking to on, on the computer. You know, Sandy, uh, before we go, go back to the phone lines, Brendan also hit on um, get the parents out of the classroom. Part of this attack on public schools and on teachers was parents at school board meetings raising hell, telling the people inside of the schools, this is what we want. The parents don't know a doggone thing, Sandy, about the education system uh, for the most part. And so they listen to others and they help ramp up this attack and assault on the schools. My mother and father would have never gone to a school board meeting and said, hey, what you're teaching my son is wrong. And I'm going to tell you, and you need to put that up. And so that too, Sandy, so the so so called protecting my child. Well, the helicopter parent yeah, phenomenon right. uh, has become, a, and it has been for quite a while, and and it has affected at least one or two generations of of children because a helicopter parent is protecting their child from the reality of the world, and so which you, they can't do, which you in the long run you ultimately can't accomplish. So I, I think it's important that that uh, we get back to having children kind of make it on their own in school with yeah. their family support at home, uh, with, li li like it needs to be. But I do know from uh, having a son who teaches that helicopter parenting can be a terrible problem for teachers because you can't deal. It's very hard to, to, to deal with all those parents and all their, all their conclusions about how their special child ought to be dealt with. All right, let's go to uh, Tom from L.A. Good morning to you, Tom. You say what? Good morning, Earl. Um, just wanted to say that um, if anyone hasn't checked out Project 2025, uh, please go to Wikipedia or go to Google and look up Project 2025. Um, second, um, I know what I'm doing right now is like this morning I was out walking three miles and I uh, saw some teachers going into school and I just said, you know what, thank you so much for what you do. And, um, and I said that uh, Tim Walls is a reminder of what public education is about. So sometimes we forget it. So I just wanted to thank you very much for what you do. And I said that to public school teachers. Um, and then also, I think Cassandra and 
Brendan are right, what happens is you have principals or people that go into, you know, the school system and their principals and then the principals move to superintendent. Yes. And, and honestly, it probably needs to be more of a teacher that actually taught in the classroom that moves into those positions of, you know, superintendent or even now what's happening. I know in Wisconsin, what's happening is um, you have people in the union, unfortunately, that have no teaching credentials whatsoever. And that's a real problem um, because you're getting more and more into that corporate world of, you know, teaching in public schools or, or, you know, superintendents that are coming from there rather than coming from the teaching field. Um, I do think it's all part of a big plan. I think Wisconsin's been hit in a major way because of um, Scott Walker and Act 10. But hopefully things are turning around and hopefully things are changing. We can't have two school systems. We either have a public school system or a private school system. And public school takes everybody. Uh, Thank you. Hey, Tom, thank you very much for the call. Uh, Hang on, uh, Gene. We'll come to you on the other side. You're tuned into the Earl Ingram Show. show as always you can join us at 844-967-2789 text us at that same number one of my favorite pete's all-time favorite songs pete seeger he was a union he was an old union organizer and a a folk singer he became a anti-war singer a protest singer and during vietnam he was phenomenal yeah well it brings back man it brings back some good old days for me uh when i was a member of 1906 uh, union for 34 years and solidarity forever uh, is one of those things. Uh, let's go back to the phone lines and Jean from McClare. Good morning to you, Jean. You say what? Good morning, fellas. I think I know a little bit about this issue. Um, my grandmothers, aunties were all teachers. And um, when I was a student myself, I experienced teachers in the Swiss, uh, you know, in the 60s, uh, you know, uh, bringing kids up in front of the class, totally humiliating them, yelling them how their parents are drunk. Mom runs around, you'll never amount to anything in front of the whole class. A guy taking a ruler, making people bend over and hit their ankles and had a, a handle on the end, just whacked them. Or if they were sitting in their seats, go behind them, kick out the chair so they fall on their back, hit their head. You know, I, I, I've seen that. Let's go ahead quite a few years. I saw this crap, and I graduated a year and a half early to start college to help kids because of what I saw, the bullying, the horrible things. And, boy, I got an education. Teachers in our society today and within, you know, in the 80s and 90s, they are amazing. They are professionals. They work their butts off. They have many bosses. They got the kids. They got the parents, they got the um, principals, and it's it's and they got school boards. Don't forget school boards. Those people go into that profession because they love children. 
they want children to be successful. And let's not forget the pay bites. I mean, these people work their butts off and they say, oh, well, they get a vacation in the summertime. The heck, they don't. They don't get paid. They get paid for the time that they're in schools. And then, not only that, then when the parents come, and I watch as a school psychologist, counselor, AOD a coordinator for school does at working with at risk kids besides that working in a clinic in a different area working with psychotherapy with kids and parents so let me tell you we need change we need to support these people they work hard they love these kids and boy do they have a lot of education <laughs> so please guys we need to fight for the teachers and kids education cuz kids and teachers deserve better, and parents, butt on unless you were a teacher, and please give them a little respect. They really have their hands full, and they've been treated badly. So thank you very much, and um, hey, you guys hey, have a great day. Hey, Gene, thank you very much for the call. So, Sandy, all the things that we've been talking about, and I wanted us to get this in before because we're going to change the subject at the, at the top of the hour. How do they fix it? Where are you going to get younger people right now who want to go into into education? Where do you see a, a bunch of young people lining up saying, hey, and, and they're in 10th, 11th grade, Calvin, you as well, saying, hey, I want to become a teacher. Why, why wasn't that something that you even thought about? Well, it actually was something I thought about. Um, I intended to teach for about a semester in college and then i decided it wasn't for me but my younger brother he is going into his first year teaching fourth grade he just got a job so yeah i think it's a lot to do with the money people aren't making enough money for the amount of work it takes to be a teacher is that the reason that you didn't want to become an educator for the most part Actually, for the most part, it had to do with I didn't want to have to deal with all the kids. Deal with the kids, yeah, yeah. So, so Sandy, again, it's it's an issue that has to be fixed. It's an issue that has to be um, taken seriously. And uh, and so, when are we going to start doing that? Well, obviously, uh, compensation is going to have to be a part of it. One of the problems for teachers is the cost of housing. You know, with the what the a cruel of great wealth. Uh, the, the wealthy people in this country are bidding the prices of houses up quite a bit. It's getting harder and harder for teachers to live in the community in which they teach. Uh, and then a society just has to, we have to rearrange our concept of education. We have to re-elevate it to the highest degree of importance. And we have to re-elevate the, the profession of teaching to one that which is held in highest regard. And those are societal things. How do we change society? I, it takes leadership. It takes the likes of, I think, uh, Kamala, Tim. I think Tim Walls will go a long way if he gets elected and people can watch him and understand that this, is a, this was a high school teacher. This is who this person is. That will help elevate, I think, in people's minds, uh, re-elevate uh, the profession of teaching. Uh, but it just needs to, be, it needs to be depoliticized. We need to stop attacking teachers as being part of the problem. And we have to start lauding them as being the solution. All right, let's go to David from Mequon quickly. Go ahead, David. Good morning. Um, you know, there's a lot of things, obviously, that need to be corrected. And I think we all agree that the current way of, you know, projection has been, it's been deplorable. It's been awful. As far as kids within the largest cities in Wisconsin in particular, not just Milwaukee, but Racine, Kenosha, Green Bay, you can just start rattling them off. And um, it's it's very frustrating. Um, and I will point out, so you guys were just talking about, you know, the governor of Minnesota, who's now vice president or nominated as vice president. Um, you know, the state of Minnesota was always regarded as one of the top uh, states as far as education. Under his watch, and I don't know the exact number off the top of my head, but the education uh, factor there has dropped significantly. Uh, they've gone down quite a few. Is, is that because of him? To be. The, you- the governor, the governor of the state. I mean, uh, they, they funneled more money to education during his term. Uh, 
So it's an interesting coincidence, or uh, or at least a correlation. Hey, David, we got we got to go. Uh, thank you very much for the call. Eight four four nine six seven twenty seven eighty nine, and we'll be talking about some things on the other side. In our hands is placed a power greater than their hoarded gold, greater than the might of atoms magnified a thousandfold. We can bring to birth a new world from the ashes of the old, for the union makes us strong.